Welcome to polynomials. In this first lesson, what we're going to do is just kind of look at the graphs of polynomials. And what I want to, uh, first of all, going to discuss is just a little warm up problem just to kind of get you introduced to polynomials. And then we'll kind of talk about the polynomial function, the characteristics, x and y intercepts, zeros, as well as multiplicity and leading coefficient tests. So to kind of begin polynomials, I think it's really important to kind of understand, you know, um, some of the important parts of what makes up a polynomial and why they can be really useful to understand. So in the first example here, just a little bit of warm up, it says you're traveling a car entering a tunnel at 45 miles per hour. The speed limit is 55 miles per hour, so you're doing good there. And but when you enter so you enter and then you exit the you uh, exit at three mile, you exit the three mile tunnel in three minutes um, and traveling 45 miles per hour. However, there's an officer waiting for you at the end of the tunnel, pulls you over and issues um, to issue a ticket. Does he have a case, he or she, um, and why? And let's just assume that maybe they kind of noticed, they must have taken note of, you know, how fast you're going before the tunnel and how long you are in the tunnel. That's kind of like the, of the understanding in this hypothetical, you know, scenario. So the main important thing is, let's kind of see if you traveled a three mile tunnel in three minutes, um, you know, how fast were you exactly going? So, you know, let's kind of look at this in the you know miles ah i got a let's zoom in here and let's i don't know why i'm in the smaller thing so let's look at this as there we go miles per hour all right so you traveled three miles let's just use three uh aisles now, what is three minutes of an hour? Well, we can just, we don't, you know, we could just represent that as a fraction. So let's just do that three out of 60 minutes because we know 60 minutes represents one hour. So you are only traveling for three of those minutes out of 60 hours. Now we can divide three divided by 60, which I believe I did before, but I'll just do it again. And that's gonna be 0 0.05. So therefore you basically have your speed here is three miles per hour over 0.05 hours. Now that's in decimal notation. And then if we take 3 divided by 0.05, we can see that we are traveling at 60 miles per hour. And we'll use this uh, MPH for miles per hour. So to travel three miles in, on, in three minutes, you've had to travel 60 miles per hour. And the way that you can kind of think about this is, you know, again, let's just kind of look at this. Let's say here's, here's time, right? And here's like your speed, miles per hour, right? So if you think about this, um, as far as your, you know, as you're traveling through this time and your speed, so you're starting at 45 miles per hour, right? And you end up at 40 miles per hour. But if the average speed that you had to get to cover that distance was 60 miles per hour, you had to go above 60 miles per hour. Now, the interesting thing about this I, of this, you know, situation is that you know, in a car, in a real life situation, your your speed is what we call continuous, right? We don't know like you could have stopped Right. I mean, you could have not gone, you know, the same period or you could, you know, literally go down to zero and just stopped and then accelerated really, really fast. Right. Um, kind of like a drag race. But and then either way, whatever else, whatever happens, you're still going to exit the tunnel at 45 miles per hour. The important thing, though, is that it's continuous. Right. You can't um, you know, we don't stop at like the beginning of the tunnel and then all of a sudden you get transported to the end of the tunnel. Right. And, you know, that you didn't travel through that whole distance of the tunnel. So the basic idea that I'm trying to bring to you on this is that the speed of the car is continuous. Doesn't matter if you stop, if you go really, really fast, but there's no way for us to go from the beginning of the tunnel to the end of the tunnel without you, tr you know, passing all of the, um, all of the distance throughout the tunnel. And that's the kind of idea of why you'd be issued a speeding ticket because at least at some point, you know, if here's the speed limit, if at least some point you had to travel above that because it takes you to travel th three miles in three minutes, you had to go at least 60 miles per hour. That's the, if you would have went, if you would have started the tunnel at 60 miles per hour and exited at 60 miles per hour, then that would have traveled that distance. Now, since you entered and exited at 40 miles, 45 miles per hour, that means at some point you had to go above 60, um, 55 miles per hour, which is the speed limit. So therefore it does make sense to issue a speed ticket. 
Now, one thing I kind of mentioned is we get into this more in detail in calculus by talking about the mean value theorem. And I don't really want to get into, you know, too much detail on this. Just kind of think about this like it's common sense that the, the speed, um, a function of a vehicle with, res with respect to time of its speed, uh, its speed with respect to time is going to be a continuous function. Okay. In this real life scenario, that is what we call a continuous function. Now, is it going to be a polynomial or whatever else? Well, you know, we'll, we can see how we can represent that. But the main important thing is I want to talk about continuity. And, you know, another way to think about continuity is like if you were skydiving, for instance, if you're jumping out of a plane, you know, 12,500 feet above sea level. Well, if you're going to travel all the way down to the ground, you are going to pass every single height above you know, the ground, there's no way for us to, you know, go at least in our real life scenario, not in these crazy hypothetical ideas, but there's no way for us to go from the top of the, you know, plane 12,500 feet and then immediately go to the ground. There's no like transporting. So the path that you can take basically take, if you want to look at this as like a function, as far as your time and your height. Now, as far as the shape of this, you know, whatever else, you know, how it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to look not saying that the curve is going to be some, but the main important thing is your the graph from you entering at time, you know, zero uh, to, you know, to you hitting the ground is going to be a continuous. There's no breaks. There's no jumps. Like we talked in functions, right? We talked about these discontinuities. There's no discontinuities here. So the reason why I wanted to bring this up for the warm up is because when we're talking about polynomial function, there's some really, really important things. Polynomial functions are continuous. So we spent all last chapter in functions talking about discontinuities and, and so on and so forth. Well, we don't have to worry about discontinuities. We don't have to worry about um, asymptotes. We don't have to worry about holes or jump discontinuities because polynomials are continuous. So basic idea of a polynomial is basically a sum of one or more polynomials with no rational or negative powers. So uh, monomial. So, you know, for instance, we can kind of give, I don't know why I didn't leave my spouse a little more space, but for instance, we can give ourselves, you know, let's do some, uh, I'll do some examples here. So a monomial could be like three X squared, you know, um, you could also have like the number five, you could have like X you know, you could have x to the seventh. Um, so if we were just to add up these monomials, these are all examples of monomials. If we were to, um, you know, just put, add them up or subtract them, because you could add a negative, then that'd be considered a polynomial. But we don't deal with rational powers, so um, non-examples would be like, you know, x to the one half because that is going to have enter in some discontinuities as well as like um, X to like the negative first. So we don't have any rational powers or negative powers. That's not going to be a polynomial because that's going to bring in discontinuities. This ends up being a, a radical with an even index and this ends up being a variable X in the denominator, which we talk about, you know, in our rules of exponents and so on and so forth. So these make these give us discontinuities and polynomials are all continuous. So that's why these are going to be our non examples. So just going to take um, monomials and then, you know, the sum of them. And that's basically what adds up to be our polynomial. So a couple things that are going to become important, which we'll talk more about, you know, later um, in, in these notes is talking about the leading term, uh, the leading coefficient, as well as the degree. So you can see here, what I did is I wrote a polynomial, and this is like the formal mathematical, you know, definition, and we'll kind of talk about this. Actually, I'll give you an example here down here. Um, you know, for instance, if I have a polynomial, let's just call this uh, 3x to the fifth, you know, minus 4x squared plus uh, 2x plus 7, okay? Um, if we're going to talk about the leading term, the leading term is, actually, let's work backwards. Um, and n is the degree. So n represents the degree of the polynomial, which is the largest power of the polynomial. And again, the powers are going to be basically the, um, the, the values that the exponents are going to be raised to. So x to the fifth, five is the power, x squared, two is the power. Here there is no um, x, so we could, uh, or there is no power written up there, so we know it's going to be one. And then here technically we could represent this as x to the zero. So since five is the highest power, we could say that the degree is five. The leading coefficient is going to be the, co uh, let's call, let's actually go for the leading term. 
So the leading term is the complete term with that has the degree. So since x to the fifth, since five is the degree, that means three x to the fifth is the monomial. So that's going to be what we call our leading term. And then the coefficient, the leading coefficient, which I just use LC for, the leading coefficient is going to be the number basically that is multiplying by that exponent. So in this case, that is going to be three. So just a quick little example here of your definitions of polynomials. Now let's talk about characteristics, which I'll do in blue. So polynomials are smooth and continuous, which we kind of talked about, meaning that there are no sharp turns or points of discontinuity. So if we just wanted to like, you know, sketch a polynomial, there's multiple, multiple versions of them, but polynomials are functions, so they're going to pass the vertical line test, and they're not going to have any, uh, again, they're continuous. That means, basically continuous means you can like trace the graph um, with your finger or a pencil without having to lift it up, so there's no discontinuities, and there's no like sharp turns or anything like that. Um, Next thing, polynomials continue indefinitely in positive and negative directions. You can see how this polynomial is, you know, I had to stop the polynomial because as I continue going to the right, this arrow is showing that the graph is going to continue going up. And as I continue drawing this graph to the left, this graph is going to continue going down. And so that is going to be um, called what we call our end behavior, which we've kind of talked about with functions and we're going to get into more detail uh, with polynomials. And then lastly, polynomials have n minus 1 extrema and at most n zeros. So when we're looking at this polynomial, remember n represents the degree, right, the highest power. So what that means is this graph, now we're not going to graph this, but if you wanted to, um, this is going to have n most polynomials. Now we'll talk about this later when we get into zeros of polynomials. The main important thing I want you to just understand from this one is that you're going to have five zeros. Now, we're going to go back to real and, and complex zeros, and I don't want to get too far into it. Just basically understanding right now that whatever the degree is, that's how many zeros you're going to have. And we'll get into more detail on that later. Also, there's going to be n minus 1 extrema, or what we call like turning points. So when a graph is obviously turning, you could see like this one, this is not representing um, this exact function, although it could, you know, who knows. But you can see here there are one, two, three, four kind of turning points here. Um, those all represent extrema. They're not any absolute um, maximum or minimums, but they are relative maximum. So you can see how those are extrema. And whatever your degree is, just subtract one. So there is four um, possible extrema. And again, we'll get into more detail at this. And, that, and that's really the you know, most number of extrema and the most number of zeros that you can have, or at least you know, real, that we will uh, kind of talk about. But we'll get into it. I just want to kind of bring it out there. Um, now, a couple of other ones, you know, things that we're going to get into more detail later in this uh, section. I just want to kind of bring them up so we kind of have a good basis of everything. The next one is x y intercepts. Just remember, guys, that the x intercept is where the graph crosses the x axis and that y is equal to zero. Um, you know, when we're going to be doing some, you know, math with this, um, let's just do, let's just do one. There you go. So just remember that the x-intercept is where the graph crosses the x-axis, right? And let's, um, you know, let's give this value, let's call this c. Just remember that this point, the y value of that graph right there is 0. So let's call that, you know, c comma 0, right? So there's an x value, which in this value we're just going to label it as c because it could be some arbitrary number, but the y value is 0. And that's very, very important. When we want to find the x-intercept, we're just going to replace y with 0 and then solve for x, and that's going to give you your value c. On contrary, for the y-intercept, that's where the graph obviously crosses the y-axis, notice that x is going to be equal to 0. So in this case, let's just use the value a to represent um, where that crosses. That's going to be 0, comma, like a. So again, to find the y-intercept, you're just going to replace the x value with 0 and solve for x, and that's going to give you that value of x is going to be our a is where the graph crosses the axis. And again, we'll get into more examples. I'm just trying to cover some of the basics. Um, now, I'm bringing this up because we use this vocabulary a lot for basically this whole chapter. We're going to be talking about zeros. And, you know, zeros of the function are, are basically what makes the value f of x equal to zero true. So we basically are finding the values where f of x is going to equal to zero. And a lot of times when we're going to be doing the math, um, we want to find the value. We basically just replace f of x with zero or y. You know, sometimes we'll be just dealing with an equation, even though it is a function, we'll, it'll be written as y. 
So we'll replace y with zero and then solve for x. Now, in terms of real zeros, those are actually x-intercepts. Now, when we talk about complex, imaginary, obviously you can't cross at an imaginary um, point on our graph. So it's still going to make F this true, but it's just not going to be represented as an x-intercept on the graph. And then last but not least here is the multiplicity of zeros. And basically the multiplicity of zeros. Now the important thing about multiplicity, which we'll look at, is only when it's in written as a linear factor. And we'll talk more about what is a linear factor, when does that come up. Um, but the main important thing is when you have a when you have linear factors written as x minus c raised to the m, m, that power of the factor is what we call the multiplicity. And if m is even, then the graph touches and at c. And if m is odd, the graph crosses at c. And again, we'll look at more examples of this. But you can kind of see like the difference here is, let's say c is here. Let's say that is my value c. x equals c. So you can see here it bounces. That means whatever c is, that's going to be an even multiplicity. 2, 4, 6, 8, you know, whatever may be the case. On contrary, let's call this, and uh, let's just look at this one. Let's call this one a. So where this x-intercept is at a. Now the difference here is you can see the graph crosses. So this, um, when we look at this as a linear factor, the multiplicity is going to be odd. You know, one, three, five. You know, whatever may be the case. So we'll look at more of these examples. Just want to kind of give you the basic understanding here of multiplicity. And that is kind of it for at least some of the general characteristics of polynomials. Um, I'm going to talk about leading coefficient here by identifying m behavior um, coming up next. So I wanted to kind of segment that in a different section. So let's go and look at at m behavior and the leading coefficient test.